All right. So with us today uh, on our Ready, Set, Lead podcast for the United States Global Initiative is former United States Ambassador to Sweden and Ambassador to the UK, Matthew Barzin. Uh, Matthew, uh, welcome. Thanks for having me. Good to be here, Howard. So we'll get to your book in a second. You are the author of the author of the power of giving away power, which is uh, published by Penguin Random House, um, and you'll see the link in our in our uh, uh, podcast link. It's a, a fascinating fascinating read. Um, before we get to the book, as we discussed earlier, uh, I am. During this pandemic, we're recording this uh, podcast in Sudbury, Massachusetts, not far from where you grew up in Lincoln. Yeah. So, mean so, so how was uh, how was growing up in, in Massachusetts? I loved it. I mean, and I guess it's true of everyone. You know, you don't know what to compare it to, really. Or so I guess if you grow up in a small pre internet -y town, like I didn't. But the weird thing is, and you know, like when you grew up, this is, I'm just turning 50. So I grew up in the seventies uh, and eighties in Lincoln and like going one town over was kind of a big deal. Uh, I mean, we take the train for 30 cents or something to Concord, but I mean, I don't think I'd been to Sudbury in the first 16 years of my life. It's right next door. We share a regional high school. Um, uh, but anyway, so I, I loved it. It was um, now reflecting back unusual um you know it is i would say small town america but it's small town new england and that's not the same thing now that i live in kentucky i'm dialing in from louisville kentucky which is um you know a, a different kettle of fish entirely so i grew up in marblehead which builds itself as the birthplace of the, of the american navy and and you know you grew up in lincoln and neighbor to concord so there's a lot of of real sort of birth of America. Um, yeah, I mean, not subtle. I mean, I remember, and you maybe felt this way too in Marblehead, but when you grow up in Massachusetts, you think Patriots Day is a national holiday. And I was like an embarrassingly old, I was like 23, I think, when I realized that not the rest of the country doesn't think that, that April 19th or whatever it is, is such a big deal. But we, in Lincoln especially, the, you know, we had the Minutemen would come to our house and people would role play and dress up like red coats. I remember seeing my dentist was a red coat and that made all the sense in the world. I was like, I knew I didn't like that guy. Um, he was actually a totally nice guy. But anyway, and then we would recreate the march from Lincoln to Concord, you know, with the fife and drum. And it was wonderful and strange. Oh, totally. I remember taking my kids uh, when they were younger to uh, Lexington on Patriot's Day and you would see the recreation. and. And frankly, you know, make yourself feel better. I'm 54. I think I was 44 before I realized that evacuation oh, day. Okay, so I'm in good good company here. I didn't know evacuation day wasn't a uh, a federal holiday or even a state holiday. I think it's a Suffolk County holiday. Which oh, I that's is, really good. Oh, we're out parochialing each other. That's yeah, no, no doubt. So you you grew up in Lincoln. Um, you have a a, a long. Uh, family lineage that that goes back to the founding of the Commonwealth. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so it's my, um, on my mother's side, it was my great times 10 grandfather was a guy named John Winthrop who left the other Suffolk uh, in England. Um, and at age, I think, you know, he, he was 40 years old, which back then was properly old and left his whole life behind to be the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, and uh, so that's sort of a neat, fun, old connection. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things I think that sometimes Massachusetts at its not best gets, gets really um, sort of overly into to all that early stuff, um, which is important. And I was a history major and I love history and all that stuff, but I reminded, a, a relative of mine who who was into that great times 10. And I was like, like the math, it's like, I think I'm, I won't get the math exactly right, but all of us have 2,956 great times 10 grandparents. That's a big number, right? If you go sort of back up the family tree, it's like, it's like and you might remember them because 
maybe they did something interesting, like do that. But there are all these other ones you just have no idea. And they probably did interesting things too. Um, and then on the flip side of that, this is a less clear number, but it's something like 700,000 other people can claim that same person as their great time saint grandfather. So let's not get too precious about it. Yeah, no, no doubt. But it's, it's, it's interesting. And, and I agree. Some of the stuff, um, traditions are good by themselves, but traditions are even more important if they're brought forward with a little bit more relevance into the common yeah. day. Yeah. Um, so you started off at, uh, at CNET. Uh, you were one of the, the, I believe, the fourth employee at CNET. Yeah, and, way back, and, 1993. I remember having to explain to my mom and to my roommates, the, you know, what an internet company was. I mean, I guess it existed. I mean, obviously it had been around for a while. The World Wide Web had just, we just had a browser. So it was all kind of new and I'd never really heard about it. I mean, in college we had access to the internet but I'd never connected to it. Um, so it's just strange. And so you were part of the development of download.com. Is that true? That is true. That was my baby. And shareware.com. I spent a lot of time, you know, just playing around, trying to save money oh, in my twenties. So cool. um, and, and, and probably most of the time clicking on the ads below. Oh, bless the, you. The link. Yeah. So <laughs> did, were you tricked into that or did you mean to? No, no, no. This is, this is, I, I would never use the word trick. I think this okay, is good. Good. We I, tried to be very, you know, clear. Transparent. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, this was we user error. We didn't want to trick people into anything, but that, but download and shareware was really um, a fun chapter because it was, it was just un. I mean, we did our part and we worked hard, but it really was just, just useful. I mean, you know what I mean. And it was just this abundance of need for people to have this stuff, and then an easy way to find it, and so. We did our part, but um, it was just fun to see something used and grow so amazingly quickly by doing something sort of simple and hard. No doubt. And it, listen, I use it to this day, and it, and it reminds me of all those uh, Mac and PC magazines that you would see in the Hudson News or in the airport uh, newsstands and sort of put all online and then even given great um, usability and great uh, uh, a, a lot more relevance. And it reminds me of what you've talked about in the past where you talked about uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica, the, mm. um, the encyclopedia. And then you talk about um, Microsoft's venture oh, into- right, yes. And, and, and listeners of a certain age could, this is a little trivia question. They could try to guess, although we're about to tell what it is. Um, because Harvard Business School wrote a case study a couple decades back, you know, who who was the company that went digital and beat Britannica, one of the oldest companies in the world? And they declared Microsoft the winner with Encarta. But it's just kind of funny now, because if you ask anyone, certainly anyone younger than we are, which is lots of people, I mean, they've never heard of Microsoft Encarta. But it, it did win, you know, in quotes, for like nine months until Jimmy Wales and his team at Wikipedia came along and you know, made both Britannica and Encarta things of the past. So that example of the encyclopedia in your time at CNET, how did that instruct sort of the um, ideals that went into the book, The Power of Giving Away Power? Well, in, in the case, maybe chronologically just of CNET, since Wikipedia wasn't around when CNET got started, but because we were competing against these computer magazines you mentioned, and they were big. I mean, you know, our favorite little tagline at the time when we were trying to get, mostly unsuccessfully, to get people to invest in our company um, was that the top three computer magazines outsold the top three business magazines three to one, something like that. And so our point was like, technology is mainstream now. It's going to be an increasingly big part of people's lives. Um, and so there ought to be, you know, websites and TV. We made all these TV shows that are no longer around um, about technology. And, um, and so one of the things, but unlike our competitors in print, I mean, PC Magazine, I forget the number, but I mean, it was a wildly profitable, really thick magazine. Um, and we, we had sort of two insights. One was they would do the definitive, let's say, printer review every November. 
and they'd have hundreds of editors and lab coats and like a whole fancy process and all this stuff. And we didn't have enough money to, you know, do any of that. But we did two things um, by necessity. One was we said, well, we're going to, what's the likelihood that you want to buy a printer in November? I understand from the publisher's point of view why it's convenient to get all the printers sent to you, have a whole process so that you can publish them all in November. But if you want to buy one in October, you have to rely on 11-month-old stale information, right? Or if you want to buy one in December, you know, so it's like, well, we'll just have a list, even if it doesn't have 400 lab coats behind it, that is just always alive. We take this sort of for granted now, but like it's always um, the, our latest take on what the good ones are. And more importantly, we would let, you know, Jill or John or just user you, you know, users of our site, let us know what they thought about this printer, you know, or the IBM ThinkPad was a big deal back then. I'm dating myself. And it's like, they're back, like the, 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 lap, the laptop battery ought to last you San Francisco to Boston. And it's like, well, they say it does, but you've done the flight, does it? You know, and they're like, yeah, it does only if you don't have, if you have the screen so dark, you can't read. But if you have the brightness on at any level, no, it'll last you halfway. And it's like, oh, that's interesting. And that's useful to people. And so user generated content wasn't a buzzword back then, but we just let normal people who weren't editors have their voices heard and try to be useful to fellow users. And so those two things together contributed to us. So you empowered, uh, you empowered others to be part of the CNET experience. Yeah, and, and then, I mean, Wikipedia, which I think is a much more impressive story, which someone coined the phrase, and I love this, the largest human knowledge transfer system in the history of the world, which is a mouthful, but I think beautiful. Um, and so Microsoft is at the time, you know, the richest company in the world by market cap around the time frame we're talking about. They have amazing engineers, really smart people. And they weren't, I mean, they could see how they could be Britannica, right? They saw the power of search. They saw the power of digital compression. They saw um, the power of hyperlinking. I mean, they could see a lot of it, but the one thing they couldn't see was the power in you or me or any of the listeners to this podcast. That just wasn't, so they adopted Britannica's same mindset, which was, we'll be the experts, we'll farm it out and pay people to write a full article for us, and then we'll hyperlink it, add images, make it compressed. We'll do all that clever tech stuff. But it was really the same mindset. Um, whereas Jimmy Wales and his team at Wikipedia, um, I don't want to chew up too much time talking about I love it, as you can tell. But I mean, they started out not as Wikipedia. They started out as Newpedia. And uh, no one's heard of Newpedia for a reason. And it was similar in that they weren't going to charge anyone to use it. And they weren't going to pay anyone to produce content. So it's similar in that way but with a crucial difference. They only wanted you or me or anyone to write full articles. And they were paranoid since they were new and they're up against Britannica and Encarta. They were paranoid that they wouldn't be taken seriously if there were any mistakes. And so they had this rigid 10 step program to guarantee that, that things were perfect. And at the end of the first year, they had only 18 articles published. 18, you know, and they're up against people with hundreds of thousands. So like, well, this isn't working. And then came the suggestion from someone on the team hey, what if we try this thing called Wiki? We'll just give away power. Basically, you could write a sentence, someone else could write a paragraph, someone else could write nothing but just help edit. And it would be this collaborative making of an encyclopedia article. And it's like, well, might as well try it. Now they have 18,000 articles after their first 12 months of trying that new approach, of giving up that power of being the gatekeeper. And plenty of mistakes on Wikipedia but it's self-correcting. By the way, there were tons of mistakes in Encarta and Britannica too. They just weren't going to reprint all the CD-ROMs or your whole bookshelf just because they found a few mistakes, right? So you talked about, uh, in your book, you talk about different uh, leadership models, uh, top-down, uh, bottom-up. And you have a, um, you've talked about uh, the, the constellations using a constellation um, theory for lack of my better word. Yeah. yeah. How, does, how does that work? Well, I mean, so Aristotle, evidently, um, the internet says it's true. Aristotle once said, um, the soul never thinks without an image. 
And I love that. The soul never thinks without an image. So we often have these images in our mind, whether we like to or not. A little test of that, if I asked all the listeners to close their eyes, and I'm going to say one word, and you tell me the first image that pops in your head, and the word is idea. You know, 90% of us, and I used to do this all the time, 90% pictured that incandescent light bulb floating alone in space with little yellow lines emanating from it to show that it's on, right? And we'll get to this later. But so that's just this image we have, we associate it with idea. And I think we have these other, that, so shapes and images can be really powerful things into how we think about ourselves and those around us. And um, I think so often we bring in this sort of pyramid shape to how we look at things because so many of our organizations are fundamentally hierarchical. Um, and there's a time and place for hierarchy and there's order and stability to it. It's just not the only kind of order and stability, but sometimes we've gotten tricked over the years into thinking it is the only way of providing order and stability. Um, and it isn't, and there's another one, and it just so happens, um, and I, at the beginning of the book, I get into the history, which we don't have time for the full version, but back in 1776 in Philadelphia, there were two declarations made on July 4th. It, it was the famous one, and then this declaration, we need a logo. And it turns out it took longer to design the logo than it did to win the war. And you can see it on the back of a US $1 bill, both sides. It was a two-sided logo. They figured that out early. What they also figured out early was a motto. It turns out they were better at words than they were at pictures. And so they came up with e pluribus unum, which we all know is out of many, one, or from many, one. So that was the good motto. But they didn't have the elements to go with it. And long story short, they finally come up after seven years, they come up with it's called the crest, the, the essence of the whole logo that goes above the eagle's head. Um, and it's this 13 asymmetrical stars. On the dollar bill, it's become regimented, but it started out different size stars, asymmetrically spaced with beams of light radiating behind it. And they called it the radiant constellation. And they thought this was the essence of the logo. And that's how we should interpret from many one, from many stars, one constellation. Now for the back of the logo, they picked the unfinished pyramid which represented for them strength and durability. And the argument I try to make in the book or the case is basically like, we so often keep putting the pyramid, the world of up, in or out, up or down, ranking, rating, sorting, sifting. We bring that perspective, those habits that go with it into every aspect of our life. And we really ought to start putting this constellation forward and, and to close with the major difference we could say from many bricks, one pyramid. And in that world, it's like you either fit in or you are left out. And the magic of a constellation is that you can stand out as an individual, a star, so to speak, and you can fit together with other stars to create something more useful, more powerful than you ever could on your own. And that I think is the best idea America has ever had. Now, we felt tragically and hypocritically short of it way back then, and we still fall short of it today, but it is the best idea. It is this idea of the technical term, I guess, is interdependence, right? And we were joking, we were talking about Concord and Lincoln and Sudbury, like, and Patriots Day. It's like, we glorify, and I get why, Independence Day, right? Um, any band of revolutionaries can declare independence. And if you Google it, they do it all the time. The hard part, is figuring out how to not be free from King George to take nothing away from that. It's like, how are we gonna be free together? Not as one giant state, but as 13 separate colonies and federalized, like all that tricky and then put it down into a constitution, again, imperfect. Um, but that idea of how we could be free together um, is really powerful. And, and to close on this maybe, and to how practical and tactical that image was, if we can't think without an image, we ought to think with this image more often, especially to try to be better than we've been historically, is George Washington gets to name five Navy ships, right? And so frigates, I guess. And so he does the USS. He's not a fanciful guy. USS United States, kind of on the nose. USS President, USS Congress, the USS Constitution, and the USS Constellation. These are practical tools trying to show how we can be free and interdependent with and through one another. And that's what the book tries to, and that same mindset is what 
made Wikipedia be incredible, what started the largest commercial organization in the world, what started the largest recovery platform, AA. There's a similar way that all those leaders in those groups were able to give away power, to make to get more, to give it away again, to make more bigger, more powerful, more useful things together than they could alone. It's, it's a fascinating leadership model, and it certainly has applications uh, in our foreign policy, which I, I hope to get to. Um, that that we are, are certainly probably strongly stronger together uh, than we would be uh, alone. Uh, and how to get there, I'd, I'd like to talk to you about a little bit. Um, sort of talking about your your time over in London. So you were ambassador to Sweden. And then you took the role of national finance chair to President Obama's re-election campaign in 2012. Is that correct? Yep. So you were nominated um, to become a U.S. ambassador to uh, the U.K. Uh, and you were sworn in in August of, of 2013. So how was that? How was that first day? I mean, this is, you know, you know, to use that quote, that, that well-worn phrase of special relationship, this is one of the most important postings on the planet. Um, how was that first day uh, in your role as ambassador to the UK? Uh, over, well, you know, and thank you for asking. It was a wonder, it's fun to reflect and strange to reflect that it was that many years ago, because it doesn't feel that long ago. I remember there was a a British sort of friend acquaintance who was living in New York City and had been for a long time. And he sort of sent me some unsolicited advice, which included, please, Matthew, don't be one of those people who bang on about the special relationship. It's a cliche and it's not true anymore anyway. So that was sort of ringing in my ears as I land. Uh, and and uh, on that first day and, and all the days that followed, um, and I think he was wrong. Um, but I think he misunderstood that special relationship somehow meant that um, we always agreed on everything and we were, um, and I don't think that is, th th that we disagree all the time. And I think that's really healthy. Um, and that the, the phrase, I think the diplomatic phrase that, that we say a lot, and I really care. I mean, images are important. I think words, these words, uh, as someone said, words create worlds. And we as diplomats often are encouraged in talking points, which are terrible things, right? I mean, talking points aren't fit for human consumption. I understand why they exist, but they're just such a drag and really crowd out a lot of other kind of important thinking. But anyway, in the talking points, you would get something like, there is no daylight between the United States and the United Kingdom as it relates to, and then you could fill in whatever global issue was going on, because most of them, the US and UK were working together on, or trying to work together on. And so if you use that phrase, no daylight between us, and I remember when I started, as I got more confident later in the role, it's like, what's so scary about daylight? Of course, there's daylight between us. And what a ludicrous standard of agreement that there isn't allowed to be daylight. And then I start to get kind of weird. I'm like, well, think about uh, a, a loving couple dancing on a dance floor. Think about two soldiers fighting shoulder to shoulder. Think about sort of any image of partnership you might have. There is always daylight between those two people. And if it weren't, it would be creepy or ineffective or both. Right. So let's just not be afraid of daylight. Um, but the other just thing, as you mentioned about first day of the UK, I mean, first day of Sweden, I think was even more impactful just because I'd never done it before. And I think there's something intrinsically, it's such a wonderful honor to have served in both those places, but the job of being an ambassador or being a foreign service officer or a team member anywhere overseas, but I just know from the ambassador perspective, I think are more similar than they are different. I mean, the, the size of the mission, as we call it, might be different. The number of US agencies represented there might be different, but the basic job of trying to increase trust, respect, and understanding between our country and whatever country you're sent to is fundamentally the same. Was there any relationship that you had overseas, whether it was in Sweden or in the UK, that, that surprised you, maybe perhaps with a, a, somebody in the foreign ministry or perhaps another ambassador? Well, the one that jumps to mind is I was... Uh, it was towards the end of my time in London. And uh, I go on Sky News, which is a major broadcaster over there, had just launched this 
big fancy new studio and they asked me to come in and be one of the interview on their first day in the new studio. So it was kind of fun. And I forget what it is we were trying to talk about during that time, but I went and tried to do my best. I had my talking points. I did my thing. I get back in the car and I pick up a Blackberry and we were all Blackberries in the State Department back then. And I miss my Blackberry, by the way. I was so good at typing on a Blackberry and I'm hopeless on an iPhone. Anyway, so I went back and I, I tried to make a point of always answering my official government email. But I just always would do my personal one, I was not so good about, but I would try to get through every day. So I had like an hour drive home. So this is a good chance to get all these things out of my inbox. And I see an email from this guy named Mark, and I don't recognize it, but he has my government email. And it said Sky News interview. And so I'm sort of thinking I'm going to get like someone saw it and maybe they liked what I said. Uh, Mark had seen it and he didn't like what I said. And this is a total stranger. And he just, I mean, flame, I guess is the is the, I mean, just lets me have it. And I guess I had said something like, oh, we're best friends as countries or something. And he's like, how dare you? Who are you to say we're best friends? He just lets me have it. I was like, oh my gosh. And he signs it, um, Mark, the bricklayer from Birmingham. And then he says, and by the way, you've probably never been outside of London or the Sky News studio or something like that. And then that sort of pissed me off. Right? I was like, I actually was proud. I'd been to 200 high schools all around the UK, done these sessions with 20,000 British young people. And I was really, and I live in Louisville, Kentucky. I know that a lot of interesting people and things happen outside of the big capital city. So in Sweden and in the UK, I was really committed to just getting out and not being. So I had been to Birmingham. I had been to, so I write him this snide email back, trying to be take the upper road, the high road kind of, but it was kind of, and I was like, yes, I've met bricklayers in Birmingham. And then I did like um, carpenters in Cardiff and I did D, I did the whole alphabet, you know? And then I got to Q and I was like, Q's hard, but you get the idea. And so then he writes me back a flame. Anyway, long story short, we develop, it started out kind of flaming back and forth. And then he reveals that he had actually come and worked on the embassy earlier in his career, uh, laying the floor of, uh, the sub basement, which I'd never been to. So I went to the sub basement, I checked out his work, I sent him a picture and it blossomed into this pen pal. And I'm, uh, I'm going to go try to see him next week for the first time when I go back to London for the first time after COVID, but we keep in touch and we've struck up this pen pal relationship and we don't agree on politics at all. Uh, and he's just a wonderful person. He happens to be a gifted and hilarious writer. Um, and so um yeah, and so it's that that is the unlikely um, relationship with with me and Mark, and I've learned a lot from him. I hope he's learned something from me, and we just really enjoy this That's this special that. relationship, which is, by the way, what the term was supposed to mean, which is not all about agreement and smile. You know, it's be honest about your differences, and that's what we've tried to do. So, piggybacking on. Uh, on that comment, and that's fascinating, by the way. I remember being um, in London uh, at the time when President Obama uh, flew into Stansted and visited uh, former Prime Minister Cameron mm. uh, just prior to the Brexit vote. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I remember seeing, you know, Marine One and the V-22s landing at the ambassador's residence. Um, remember it vividly. In retrospect, was the decision of the president to sort of weigh in on uh, the Brexit vote? Was it a mistake? Was it a good thing? Or was it sort of a, a, neutral, uh, a you know, neutral outcome? That's a good question. I mean, I, and I guess I have more distance from it. I do remember just my, in because I had to answer that question officially for so many months after that happened. I guess nine months after he said it, but it never went away as an issue. So in that sense, it's like, look, if, if we could phrase it differently, I'm sure we would, he would. But to the core of your question, I think the answer is, yeah, look, we, we, I, I think if we didn't say anything, we would be criticized or we beat ourselves up for not having said something. And, and the way I tried to, this was not in the talking points, and this always made our wonderful press team uncomfortable. But I would talk about it in terms of marriage. And I would say, 
I don't know, we've all had friends who are struggling in their marriage. And maybe they come and they ask you for advice about it. And it's like, of course you care and you probably do have an opinion. And if you're asked as a friend, you will share it. And you never know what it's like to be in someone else's marriage ever. And, and often if you're giving advice, if you're asked for it, or if you're not asked for, you know, it's like you really have to bring that humility of like, we don't know, but if you ask, which is what the position President Obama and the administration were in of like, if you ask, yeah, we do selfishly. And always, even in the couple scenario, it's like, oh, well, we have fun going out together. You're fun to have over for dinner. It'd be more fun for us if you stayed together, but hey, we don't know. And so I think it was meant more in that spirit of, we love what you do as, you know, you make the EU more constructive to work with when you guys are part of it, because you kind of get us in a way others might not, and we get you in a way we might not there. And so it can be really helpful and useful. So. You know, and we probably just didn't say, but of course we did. Actually, we always said, but of course it's up to you. Of course it's up to you. Right. But people tend not to remember. This is a lesson I've tried to learn in life that someone told me, wonderful, wise Texan named Stephen, who in his marriage, they have this rule that if you ever say the word but, in the sense of, oh, that was really great, but they have to take out the trash. Whoever in the couple says that. And I think there is something in diplomacy that I learned too late, which is if you say something really nice and then you say, but no one remembers the nice stuff before the but. Right. So just don't either don't waste your breath with that or better yet, don't say but construct it a different way. Uh, that's good advice. Uh, so you, you were dealing with the Brexit issue uh, while you were overseas. Also, uh, when you were posted in London, uh, the issue of the Syrian chemical weapons uh, hmm. tragedy was happening. Uh, President Obama set a red line. Uh, Prime Minister Cameron went to Parliament for permission to uh, participate in strikes, whether as part of a coalition or whether individually. Uh, he was not given that uh, permission. He was shot down by Parliament. The President uh, President Obama then goes to, decides to hold off on the strikes and decides to go to Congress. Um, what, were, what were your thoughts on, on how that played out? And, well, and behind the scenes, not. sort of, how did, that, how did that feel? I mean, you know, 25 feet to my left, as I talk to you today, is a framed picture of that morning after those events you very wonderfully and accurately um, recounted just now. So the morning after that happened, which was the, the vote in parliament, I guess right before the, the day of President Obama deciding to go to Congress, the largest circulation newspaper, The Sun, in the UK printed a death notice for the special relationship front page above the fold. And so I have a copy of it framed. And it was funny. I mean, I didn't find it that funny, but it was, I think, objectively funny to most people. And it was like beloved child of... Uh, you know, Winston Churchill and FDR, dearly beloved of Thatcher and Reagan, and it went through the whole thing. Um, and then it said funeral to be held at the French embassy, which was like another, you know, and there was like no flowers, please, or something. And so it was funny. And I think it gave, and then I started to look back all the other times the special relationship has been declared dead. And it turns out it's, um, it's all the time. I mean, it's when George W. Bush was first elected, I think he went to Mexico City before coming to London. It was declared dead then. Suez crisis. I mean, it depends where you want to go back. But in any decade, you can certainly find multiple times where it's declared dead. And it's usually declared dead because of disagreement. And so it would give me an up. And as I reflect on it now, like we were saying before, if we aren't good friends as countries, and we really are good friends as countries, um, despite the way I might have annoyed Mark and the bricklayer from Birmingham, so to speak, in the way I said it, I think we really are good friends. And sometimes we get tricked into thinking that we do hard things together, whether it's military or trade or intelligence or some other facet of our relationship, that we do hard things together because we're friends. And there is a truth to that, but mainly the way it works, I think, is that we are friends because we've done hard things together. And so go, So we shouldn't fear the friction of disagreement or 
So I just kind of think of it as like this agreement and disagreement and gratitude and resentment and competition and cooperation are all really healthy parts of any relationship between countries, between people in a marriage, you name it. Like we just not be afraid of that. So that's how I reflect on that, um, on what happened there. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of something you said, which is uh, about friendships, you know, where if you go up to someone and say, I want you to be my best friend, you know, if I look at you, like you have three heads and we'll look for a restraining order. Whereas. Yeah. yeah or, or, or trust me. Like what a weird, right. If someone says, trust me, and you don't really know them that well, it's like, Oh dear, you brought up trust. Like I'm going to start doing the opposite, you know? Um, and happiness, I think is another one of those things that's like, and it's mysterious, but we all know it at a certain age um, that it emerges from other, it's a byproduct of other things. And if you aim for it, you probably won't get it. So in November of 2016, uh, just shortly after the election, you stated in quite diplomatic uh, tone that the uh, special relationship uh, will remain, that the relationship between the UK and the US will endure whatever the next administration um, threw at it. Uh, now that we're sort of on the other side of that, inside the uh, Biden administration did that uh did that prognostication come true yeah I, re- I i think so um i remember right around the time i said that i had to do that whole it's all a blur because i was up all night i had to pretend i didn't have any political opinions which is an important part of the tradition like you're not a democrat or a republican ambassador and and there's a wonderful multi-decade long tradition of both parties and i wanted to preserve that but of course every i mean you know my politics aren't that hard to figure out based on who sent me over there and just pretending for six hours was hard enough we had a big party at the embassy and then pretending on television you know is sort of exhausting right um because of course i had these feelings that didn't go away but anyway so i in one of those interviews the the, the person at the bbc said um that was a diplomatic answer. And then I was like, is that a compliment? And she's like, not at all. <laughs> I was like, oh, thank you for being so honest. Uh, yeah. So that was sort of safe diplomatic uh, language. I did believe it. Um, and because I think it, it exists. Um, and the press, obviously, and for understandable reasons, emphasizes who's in number 10 Downing and who's in 1600 Pennsylvania and how do those two get along? And that's not nothing. But I got to see, and it's a wonderful part of both jobs, but especially in the UK, of just the flow of just official Washington. Forget all the amazing cultural um, ties and business ties and familial ties between these two countries, but just the official government stuff alone, the flow of uh, men and women back and forth, uh, doing hard work together, um, that I got to see in London. And whenever they came to London, it was never to talk about US UK relations. I mean, that took up maybe 5% of the airtime. It was all about, you touched on a civil war in Syria, South Sudan, climate change, you know, you name it, all the other things around the world where the US and the UK are engaged. And it lives, and I didn't see this exactly up close, but I would see because they would come to London, all these um, men and women at these NGOs, big ones you've heard of, small ones you've never heard of, all around the globe, who have been working shoulder to shoulder, so to speak, and literally doing hard work on whatever it is they do, public health, uh, girls' education, you know, does, all of the spectrum. And they've been working together doing hard work together and the bonds of friendship, trust and understanding between those folks is so strong and so real um, that that provides kind of the ballast for the special relationship, um, no no matter who's in in the office uh, on Pennsylvania Avenue or number 10 Downing. And by the way, I know we're not going there yet, but like I am seized with this idea about this global vaccine rollout and it's really hard work. And it's, you know, you've got medical challenges, logistical challenges, financial challenges, ethical challenges, like, okay, this sounds like something. 
and with a really short time horizon. And for citizens in the United States, for citizens in the UK, for people around the world to watch, and I think the US and the UK with lots of other countries, but I just pick on those two, can set a really important pattern and tone for how to start doing this and how to correct where it's going wrong and just stay on this. That could build so much faith and trust and respect and understanding about what we can do together. And I think it's so important. So you look at, you mentioned COVID and, and perhaps throwing uh, climate change as well. These are, these are things that are supernatural, uh, supranational. Uh, they affect every country on the planet. Yep. How does, how do the principles of, of that are contained in, in your, in your book, the power of giving away power sort of permit um, or lend itself to America working with other nations, friend or foe alike, uh, yeah. to start tackling some of these issues, including COVID uh, and climate change. I mean, to me, and, and that list you just read and that I talked about earlier can seem, and from one, are just so daunting, right? And I go, I fall back to this amazing woman who is sort of the matron saint of, of my book, but much more importantly, a whole way of thinking um, from Quincy Mass, Mary Parker Follett, who most people haven't heard of. She's this remarkable woman. She's writing 100 years ago, which 100 years ago, when America's coming out of a global pandemic or trying to, everywhere she looks, she sees racial, social, economic division. Everywhere she looks, she hears raging debates about fear of big business, equally raging debates about the fear of government overreach. Sounds kind of familiar. And she says, look, I get how those things can be daunting, but she had this very practical and tactical way of suggesting what each of us as citizens might do about it, beginning at our next Monday morning meeting, no matter is what it is we do. And she had this kind of awesome and radical in a good sense of the word idea of like, that democracy lives in our meetings. It's not just on voting day. It's like, how do we treat each other sitting around a table in the workplace, at a nonprofit, a PTA meeting? I mean, really at any scale, at any location. And she says, and this is an answer to your question um, about all these global hotspots, because she's like, there's only, there are four possible outcomes of a meeting. Only one of them is worthwhile. Bad outcome number one, you come in with a fully fledged idea and try to win. Why did you have anyone else at the meeting? Bad outcome number two, the opposite. You just acquiesce. It's like, oh, Matthew seems fired up. Just let him have his day. It's like, no, Howard, you're denying the group a unique perspective, your own. You got to participate. Bad outcome number three, compromise. I know we're all told it's good, but she's like, no, compromise is just little mini victories, little mini acquiescences. You don't get any more than a subset at best of what you came in with. She thinks the only reason you should get around a table with other people is to co-create, to make something together. And we all know that feeling because we've all had it in our personal or professional lives, not as often as we'd like. But if you leave a meeting having made something together, you didn't come in with it fully formed. You maybe came in with a piece of it. But the magic happens is that you are forever part of that thing you made, right? It might be a product. It might be a product roadmap. It might be a determination. It might, I mean, it doesn't really matter. It might be a syllabus. I mean, anything. But the act of making with other people, it is forever part of you. And we too often... And so if you go to those global challenges, if we could start more meetings in our lives with the following six words, I don't know, maybe we might dot, dot, dot. And certainly in the case of climate, in, this, in the case of global COVID vaccine rollout, we need to bring this blend, which shouldn't be strange, but too often it is rare, of Deep, humi deep humility and deep commitment to try to figure it out together, right? And so if we bring that kind of attitude to these things, because whatever plan we come up with for phase one won't work perfectly, and we should all know that, what does? And this is where the US and the UK, I think, can be great leaders because we're able to be really honest with each other. And that flow of information back of what's working, what's not, where are their gaps, and then try to improve, and then do it again, and then do it again. And all of that activity and the humility of like, I don't know, maybe we might figure this out together for now and let's revisit it and let's revisit it. That sounds kind of boring and mundane, but like that's where all the energy, innovation and differentiation can come from.
and, and just to bring it uh, back around sort of uh, current times, um, even more current uh, last couple of weeks is this AUKUS alliance uh, with the US, yeah. UK and Australia, uh, this network of democracies, uh, you know, working together to solve, you know, global security challenges. Um, it's a nice Asian and Pacific bookend to NATO. Um, yeah, which I think so. And, but, you, but we've also seen is how, to me, you see the pyramid. So that is a strong constellation of independent and interdependent amazing countries finding something more powerful and useful than they could alone. Great constellation example. The reaction to it um, from our from the French, and you know, if you bring, um, and look, I'm not close enough to know, but clearly major feelings were hurt, right? I mean, recalling the French ambassador is not a small thing to do. It really hurt their feelings. I hope there's, and I think there's no better person than Tony Blinken, a secretary of state, and you know, to try to heal that hurt. And I think we will. Um, but in that world of like, okay, well, this new allegiance, you know, that that something new here, that sort of zero sum mentality, then that is an insult. Now, in case, I mean, they lost a contract, so there was zero sum in that sense. But in terms of alliances and new combinations, what's fun about the constellation as an image to keep in our mind is that you can have one you know, stars can be in multiple constellations. And I think that's true of you as an individual who you choose to affiliate with, but also as a country. And that's really powerful too, and not limiting. And, and so sort of the whole idea behind the US Global Initiative is to sort of empower liberal democracies to gather together in coalitions and alliances. Do, in your opinion, do these constellations become the larger they are, do they become more attractive? Oh, that's a good question. I have not thought through that. What do you think? I think I think on some level, success breeds success. Um, I think when you show the attractiveness of a of a, a winning formula or a try to be successful formula, um, I think it's helpful. I think there's a strength in numbers for some allies. Um, and I think when you show that a system can be defended uh, and that it's worthy of defending, uh, it does uh, serve as an attractant. And yeah. the more open, yeah. and if you have more partners, it shows that you're willing to listen to your partners, which makes other partners more willing to join. I, that all makes sense to me. I, the only caution, I guess I would say on size is um, what is often misunderstood, um, as I've discovered in the weeks talking about this book with smart people around the world is um, it can be misunderstood. And I'm certainly not advocating is this is some collective thing, like a big group hug consensus, kumbaya. And you can probably tell by the tone of my voice, like those are legitimate things. Plenty of people can want a group hug and kumbaya. And there is a time and place for that that is not what I'm advocating. And I don't think a constellation mindset is a group hug. Um, it, and, and, if you go back to Wikipedia, so there is rigor, deep, crucial rigor around these successful organizations and innovations like Wikipedia. It's a miracle 20 years later that it hasn't become some awful corkboard of the internet of self-promotional crap. And try it. If you try to go write something about your favorite, um, you know, about yourself, like it will weed it out. I mean, it may last for a couple of days or a couple of weeks, but the system will the system is rigorously trying to make encyclopedia-like articles. That's what they do. Um, it is not self-published poetry. It is not a lot of other things that can live somewhere else on the internet. And the rigor behind Visa, the rigor behind AA, which is another constellation and recovery platform, all these groups took, you know, 12 steps are famous, but less famous is the 12 principles that say how groups within AA work together. So. If you have to water down that rigor in the name of adding more people, then I think it can just become some sort of a million stars in the night sky and you lose the usefulness of it. So really quickly, because you've been so generous with your time, um, you referenced uh, visiting uh, schools um, in the UK and you've recounted the stories about how you asked, you handed out pieces of paper and you asked the students to come up with sort of a, a vision uh, or a question that they had. And a lot of them were 
um, we're about guns or we're about, we're about uh, racial justice, we're about violence in the United States. Mm. So just piggybacking on that, um, how, much, how much do American values and behavior at home impact our ability to lead overseas? Yeah, okay, well, thank you. This is a good one to end on, I think. Um, so yeah, so I would ask them, what is your biggest frustration or confusion about the US and what we're up to? 20,000 index cards, 10,000 of them had the nearly identical doodle, which was a gun. So half the young people to 10,000 people wrote a handgun, followed by racism and police brutality. And so I would make a word cloud after everything. And by the end, I remember showing one to Secretary of State Kerry and to President Obama and to anyone who came to visit. I just had them printed out. I was like, well, here's what young people in Britain are concerned about. And I color coded them not very subtly. It was red if it was, quote, domestic and blue if it was foreign policy, which is what we as diplomats were trained. All the talking points were about you know, foreign policy. And so there were blue foreign policy words on there, our support of Israel, um, Middle East peace, drones, surveillance, You know those which we talked about. I mean, those are foreign policy things. We would talk about those. They were pretty small on the word cloud, but guns, racism, police brutality, and then healthcare was fourth. We're just dominating. And so my point was, look, foreign policy, Domestic policy is foreign policy, because to the extent that they trust, respect, and understand the United States and what we're up to and why we want to work together, like what we're doing at home is foreign policy. So we need to talk about it. We don't have to convince them that they should adopt our gun laws or vice versa or the culture. Of the I mean, they're so different. And by the way, that is one issue where we're so similar as countries on a bunch of things. We are just so far apart culturally, historically, legally, you name it, on guns. Um, and But so I continued that coming back home. I had no reason to keep doing that um, in America, but I, I learned something every time. So I kept doing it, not at that scale, but in Kentucky and in Southern Indiana and same format. And the number one fear and confusion. Go, oh, because we did the happy part too with the British kids, which was like diversity, freedom, opportunity, and food with a big four on the positive side. Um, but back home here, it was number one frustration was division, social, racial, economic. Number one hope and inspiration was diversity. So that same root, div, is what they fear most and want most. So it's rooted in separateness, right? So as I dug with these young people into that thing, you discover, and I think this is true of old people like us, what they really want is to stand out as their own selves and fit into something bigger, right? Um, and that's what the constellation as an image and from many one as a motto that modifies that image ought to leave us. That's the best idea America's ever had. We keep falling short and we ought to keep striving to do it. How we can be free together. And that's how you can be your own self and stand out as a star. Look at everyone else around you also as a star and make new combinations. And I know that's what you're trying to do with this podcast and the great work you're doing. So thank you for letting me be part of that. No, I appreciate it. And uh, this was a real treat. And I would encourage everyone to read uh, The Power of Giving Away Power. Uh, it's available now, Amazon. Uh, Penguin uh, Random House. Uh, it's a remarkable uh, read. Uh, Ambassador Marfew Barson, thank you so much. This has been a real treat. Thank you so much. Great to be on.